Hello and welcome to Your City. I'm your host, Lynn Turner Fitzgerald, and my guest today is City Administrator Chris Kukulski. I want to thank you for being here. And also, uh, this is the first time we've met. Yeah. So well, very nice to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm sorry it's taken me so long to get out and meet you. Well, eventually. You know, <laughs> all, all things happen eventually. Chris, you have been the Billing City Administrator for how many years? Uh, I started ZZ Veterans Day of 2018. Okay. So just a little over five years, push, right. pu starting to push six years. But you were in Montana prior to that. I was. I, I, I had the good fortune. I spent 15 years uh, in the Gallatin in Bozeman as uh, city administrator for uh, 13 of those. And then I was up in Kalispell as their city manager for five years. So came out to Montana. My wife and I came out in 1999. After we honeymooned in 94 in Glacier Park and came back, came back, and all three of our girls have been born and raised in Billings. We have uh, one getting ready for law school in the fall. She and her husband are launched, and I have one who uh, who's just graduating next week. Okay. From college, and then our youngest is uh, is a junior at Billings Christian School. Goes pretty fast, doesn't it? It, it flies by, as <laughs> they all tell you. It really does. <laughs> well, now in terms of the city of Billings, can you see any major shifts or changes in the four or five years that you've been here? Yeah, in fact, something done in all those locations is uh, both Kalispell, Bozeman, and now here is welcome our new hires mm -hmm. uh, at the city, and um, I saw a very significant transformation for the Billings groups. So about once a month, we'll do orientation. And prior to COVID, they were overwhelmingly Montanans, a lot of people who uh, were from Billings, sure. who came to work for us. Um, but now it very much resembles what I saw both in the Gallatin and the Flathead, which is we will have, uh, it's not uncommon to have at least half of the people around that table are coming from out of state, mm. with the other half coming from all over Montana. And sometimes the ratio is even higher wow. for folks who are coming in. And, and if you look at our uh, uh, projected, or what we believe, how we've grown since the 2020 census, um, you, there's, a, there's a meaningful uptick in that. I often say Billings is kind of the tortoise that wins the race. <laughs> For five, six, seven decades, we've had a nice, slow, steady growth rate, one, sure. one and a half percent a year. Um, and all of a sudden, here the last three years, that's, I think, ticked up to two, two and a half. And those don't sound, yeah. don't sound like big numbers if you're in private enterprise, but when you're running an operation serving 120,000 citizens and another 50 to 70,000 visitors daily or people who are doing business, those percentages add up pretty quickly. Where are they living? I'm you, referring to the the affordable housing oh, yeah, crisis yeah. that we've got. Well, and I, and I think you know what I've learned over the years. So much of that is just relative. Mm -hmm. Because if they're coming from the West Coast, when we interview folks oh, sure. and they're coming from the West Coast, this is a screaming deal. Oh my <laughs> gosh! Wow. Yeah. That's what I can get if you're coming from the Midwest or other parts of Montana, it tends to be a, a little bit more of a sticker shock or right. is still seemingly affordable for Montana as compared to, again, Missoula, the Flathead, the Gallatin. But you're right. It's, I saw a number over the weekend. The average median home sale price in the United States now is 485 Okay. That's a long ways away. Yes. <laughs> so it's an interesting observation about COVID. Yeah. What else changed? What else did COVID change for city operations? Anything significant? Well, we we for the first time in many many decades, I think it, it's become a challenge to hire staff. Uh, hmm. uh, we we were for the most part an organization where folks would come to work and may, and, and work a career, and um, sure. and we still have some of those. In fact, we just recently. I uh, thanked uh, a gal who worked in our uh, water department for 48 years. My. We have a number of folks over the last several years who have had 35, 40, 45 years. But that doesn't seem to be the trend heading forward. We'll have folks who come to work for us and they may stay six months, they may stay a year or two. They seem to be much more mobile. So hmm. that's part of what we're having to, to make adjustments on. Right, right. Um, 
so I'm going to switch gears here yeah. a little bit uh, and move into our homeless population yeah. in Billings, which obviously has increased. I don't know that COVID had anything to do with that, no. did it? Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. You, statistically, I think nationally, they say after COVID, there was a lot more, you see an uptick in homelessness. I think maybe the direct tie is more to cost of housing. Oh, than it is to to COVID, mm -hmm. and so you know you and I, uh, or I won't speak for you. Also, I'm old enough to be able to quote all these earlier numbers we paid for our first or our second or our third home. You know, you can't that, buy a car for it today. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. I, in fact, I insisted the last vehicle we bought, just a couple of years old, had to be less expensive than the first house we bought. I'm with you there. But I was only within a thousand bucks. I think. I know. I know. So um, I actually think it, it, it's home housing cost yeah. and rental cost mm -hmm. uh, uh, as well. I look at rents, and I, I, I do. That's an area we really empathize with younger generations and they said i've got a 24 26 year old son-in-law seeing them pay for rent what we paid for you know mortgages even that an entire monthly budget yes really yes what yeah. they're paying now so that is certainly an issue that's right that, you know that's affecting billings and the nation so what i think we have uh, going for us in billings it's a little tougher in some of the other Montana communities is, is we do have some synergy of size being 120,000 uh, working with the development community to see more uh, homes, apartments, uh, more stock on the market mm -hmm. to try to uh, meet that demand on mm -hmm. the supply side. And we, and we do have very good social services, I think, yeah. in this community. Yeah. But I think everyone's being stretched just a little thin. A absolutely. On, absolutely. On every front. Yeah, and I think, you know, part of uh, the, we, we like, Montana is, has very lean governmental services, and, and that's generally been uh, a, a culture that's been a positive thing. Where we've seen that get stretched too thin, though, is, I think, as an example, in the public safety area. Right. You know, you see what's happened to our community in particular starting uh, somewhere mid-last decade, 2015, 2016, 2017. You see uh, crime start to climb at a quite a bit higher pace and not the resources to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm so grateful that was one of the first things we tackled, or and still are, but we got into very seriously in 2019 and 2020, was um, figuring out what are the needs of uh, our criminal justice system, particular city police department, our courts, our prosecutors, in order to meet the needs of our community. And in going to our community and asking them for that support, they overwhelmingly gave that to us. So now for us, the real chore is to retain that level of trust, show them we're using those dollars mm -hmm. exactly as intended uh, to make a difference. The bad news is as we continue to grow and some things climb, you are still unfortunately seeing bad headlines from time to time. You know, More so than ever, really. Yeah. And brazen. Yes. More yeah. brazen than ever. Yeah. Um, so, again, switching gears a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Does the city benefit financially from the marijuana shops um, or marijuana I income, I guess sure. I should say. I'm going to say clearly the net is not positive. Oh. So that the cost of um, uh, THC and marijuana, just like the cost of alcohol, okay. the cost, the, what those cost us in the uh, uh, criminal justice system, law enforcement services, prosecution services, all of that exceeds several magnitude over the revenue we get. Do we get revenue? Yes. It is the one area in my uh, 25 years in Montana where the legislature gave us some true local control, mm -hmm. voted in, voted out. Our voters said no to recreational, but our voters said yes to taxing it. And so that 3% tax across the county brings us right around $600,000 a year. So mm -hmm. what I would say is, $600,000 is real money, but if we were to do the math and say, okay, 
Well, that's the, cost? the equivalent of six police officers. Right. And that's not even their patrol cars. Actually, now a patrol car is costing us about the equivalent of of a year's salary. So if each officer is two hundred thousand dollars between their right. compensation and their equipment, that's three. I'm pretty confident that there's more <laughs> than three yeah. being affected right. um, by by that. But I again, I want to emphasize it's not just. THC because that, that same effect is 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 on alcohol and other things and right. the responsible use of these things Isn't a problem, but we know unfortunately We're seeing addiction levels and the problems associated with them at a staggering level. Yeah. Yeah, and then you sometimes throw in um, a mental health crisis or an event that really exacerbates everything Exactly. Pro probably one of the best examples I think I could give is look at um, uh, the transformation that's happening in um, emergency response. Is. So um, not that long ago when you dialed 911, you would expect uh, to see either a police officer respond to that call, a firefighter, and or an ambulance. Mm -hmm. We now need to essentially, uh, it's called priority dispatching. That dispatcher uh, has now additional choices. Is it a medical response team that should be responding? Because that's a much more efficient way. Sure. If they don't need one of those other three, but they've got something medical going mm -hmm. on. If they're having a behavioral health crisis that's not dangerous, uh, we now have a crisis response team. Okay. And that team, again, is better positioned to meet the need to help the individual who's having a crisis yep. and far less costly and not tying up a police officer or a fire engine. Mm -hmm. um, all of that just in the past roughly 24 months is changing for us here in Billings where we are... Well, it sounds like it's becoming more efficient. It is. It's, it, it is a more efficient use of delivery of those services. Mm -hmm. It's also a transition for the public when you're in that crisis and you dial 911. And how often do you do that? Yeah, thankfully for most they don't. Yeah. But at times they do get frustrated. Like I'm just, I just need. I'm giving you my address. Get here. Mm -hmm. And when they make that call, we may have sent the unit, but that person on the line is asking a lot of questions, all trying to cater and make sure that what we're sending is is to the best of our ability, the appropriate response right. to that service for efficiency and. To meet the needs of what the what the individual is going through. Sure. You know, if you're if you're truly having a, I mean, Montana unfortunately has got a horrible suicide problem. You probably don't need a law enforcement officer. You know, in your home or knocking on your door to help you in if that is the situation. Right. But someone who's skilled and expertise is in mental health, behavioral health. So. Those things, um, we're just in the early stages of making those transitions uh, in the city of Billings, and you're going to see over the next few years, I think, quite a transformation. And it's not just the public sector. Our Behavioral Health Crisis Response Unit is a partnership between Rimrock Foundation and the city. They supply the behavioral health substance abuse expertise. We've got an EMT as a part of that team and the two of them, uh, that's that crisis response unit. Okay. So there's just two people on it. So on each, on each unit. So oh, okay. actually we've got two units right now. So those will be some areas actually we've found we will want to expand that mm -hmm. the effectiveness and the efficiency of that, those units help save the police department in many cases, not all cases. Sometimes no. they need, you know, there's a security issue. Right. Um, but part of that is this will evolve over the next several years. What I've learned from other cities is as we get more and more accustomed to what that looks like and learn what our community's um, needs are. Right. Okay. Um, taking another turn here, uh, local option tax. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Yeah, well... Are we doing that? Are we, no. Is that still alive? N n no. As a 
No, in fact, the only, well, I say the only local option tax we have is the one on, on marijuana. Okay. Now, Montana has a local option tax statute. It works fantastic for those towns under 5,500 population. Um, I've worked, uh, this is the furthest I've been in the shadow. Well, I guess Red Lodge is close enough. So when I was in Kalispell, Whitefish had one, in Bozeman, Big Sky had one, mm -hmm. and now here, Red Lodge. Um, by state law, we're too big mm -hmm. to allow our tourists to help pay for things. <laughs> so um, whether each of these communities I've managed are quite dramatically different than one another, and yet they share the fact that each one of us plays host to literally millions of visitors. Right. And um, we don't have a way for them to help pay for services. So one of, uh, I, it would be wonderful, I think. In fact, the conversation I've been having for the last 10 years with legislators is, I understand you don't want to see government grow. So I tell you what, you give us the option to take to our citizens a local option tax, voter approved every penny for tax relief. And you're still having that conversation. We're still having that conversation. <laughs> The, the lack of trust, yeah. the lack of confidence, as you, as you know, Montana, we just, sales tax is something yeah, no, we force not. our gubernatorial candidates to sign in blood yeah. when they start running for office that they won't do it. But I do think at some point it will change in part because it's just gotten more expensive to buy a home in Montana, to live in Montana. And we shouldn't fleece our visitors. So, it's important. So back that up. Did yeah. I did I hear you say it would be for tax relief? Yes. I, I so So I'm a Montana and I currently do not pay a sales tax. I correct. go to the grocery store, I pay no sales tax. Yep. This changes. I go to the grocery store, I pay a sales tax. Well, so what are you doing for me on the back end? So I'm gonna change uh, on the back end what I'm saying is every dollar we collect you get as a credit. Nice. On your property tax bill. Okay. What I want to correct, though, is even in the communities who have local option sales tax, you're not going to get taxed at the grocery store. Oh. Because it's not a general sales tax like you might see in Tennessee or Wyoming or whatever. It is more targeted at uh, visitor, so prepared food. Okay, and drinks, restaurants, but not hospitality, not groceries. Okay, um, hotels and motels or rentals, rental car, rental skis. Will we pay these things? Yes, you would pay these things. But in Whitefish is a good example. They use twenty-five cents of every dollar they collect for tax relief for, to reduce their property tax bill. Hmm. And under state law today, that that law has to be reconsidered by the voters every 15 years. It sunsets. Each time it comes close to sunset, their citizens per approve it at a higher percentage than last really? time because they see that they literally are saving dollars. Now that's 25 cents on the dollar. I'm advocating that everything we collect, you could say, you could not say do, give that as a credit so just to keep it simple, we collect $10 million in sales tax, local resort sales tax. If our property tax collection is $15 million, our property tax collection only needs to be five. So everybody who is paying a property tax could see a direct credit on their bill. The other tweak I think you'd have to do is you'd have to share it regionally. And I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. So let's say, to keep it simple, 75 cents of every dollar collected would go back to Billings residents or Yellowstone County residents. Mm -hmm. But 25 cents would go to all of our neighboring counties. So carve Montana into seven trade areas. Oh, yeah. So that someone from um, uh, Bighorn County, they'd also see their county tax reduced mm -hmm. a small amount based on the cost sharing method because they too do come to town right spend money but it's not on groceries it's not on vehicles it's not on your you know your silverado it's not on standard regular goods uh, uh, it is more targeted at 
luxury and tourism. But after 25 years, it's gotten nowhere. I know. It's gotten nowhere. So Well, there's always seems to be sort of a a fear built around it like if if we take if we stick our toe in that water yeah, yeah. and get wet, then it, the law itself ultimately will morph into something more sure. horrible. Sure. So the good news in Montana, right? We have a constitution that has a 4% cap on a sales tax. Oh. So somebody was thinking back in 1972 right. Right. that we might want to do this someday and oh, it's yeah. got a cap in it. Okay. But I, I, I certainly have worked in this business long enough to know that that distrust is exactly one of the primary things that's keeping us from making that switch. Mm -hmm. But that being said, to build a strong economy, a strong community, the private sector needs to thrive. Sure. They're the ones who create the jobs. They're the ones who employ. There tend to be thriving communities that are safe, mm -hmm. that have excellent school educational systems for you know, their employees' kids. Um, and there's a general level of qual quality of services that they want to see. Um, and so to me, that's the trade-off that, right. that could happen, not exclusively on the backs of property owners, if we made a tax uh, shift from property tax, income tax dependent, we, to sales tax, income tax at the state level. We don't get any income tax at the city level, but... I don't think it's going to happen I don't in my think lifetime. It, I don't think it is either, which is why we probably shouldn't take so much time talking I know, about it. But it's interesting to me. It's a really interesting topic. So we have about five minutes left. What's your future vision for Billings? Say five years, ten years? Sure. Well, we're there's going to be another 50 to 75,000 people who are moving into Billings, Montana. Where right? are we going to put them? I think that's without question. Mm -hmm. what, what no one knows is what, how long will that take? Will that be over 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? You say, where are we going to put them? Oh my goodness, look, you know, get on the rims there and take a look on the new Skyline Trail and look across. And if you were in all kinds of parts of the country, you might say, where would you put another 50, well, 70,000 people? Keep in mind, I grew up here. <laughs> I, I know. I've seen it morph and yes. morph and morph. So I'm not suggesting that that's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, right. but it's going to happen. I know. I was driving the other day and there's agricultural land on either side of this very busy street. And I thought to myself, this is cool. I can look out here and see a cow. Yeah, yeah. But how long will it last? So, so part of what we have to do, uh, con uh, continue to get better at, at, frankly, is land use planning. Yeah. Don't stick our heads in the sand thinking they're not coming. They're, they are coming. And, and coming, I didn't tell you specifically, you know, I was from southeast Michigan. I grew up in the Thumb, 70 miles north of Detroit, 35 miles east of Flint. Um, some of our friends from Butte could tell us what it's like to contract from 120,000 down to 30,000 residents. That's not fun. So it's a good problem that we have people who want to move here and people who want to start businesses and grow yes. their businesses here. Right. But think being thoughtful about how we do that in such a way that could you actually imagine, not everybody, especially probably not those who were born and raised here, but could a person come here and say, you know what, I actually like it better at 170 than I did at 120 because we did really oh, yeah. the value of what got built in the community added value. You mentioned the trail system yeah. and we should be so proud of that. Yeah. We should be, so, and that's really not a city function, is it? That's private? Well, or, well, it's a partnership. Okay. I mean, Skyline Trail was a grant in a partnership project between the city and, and, and nonprofits in our community, yeah. TrailNet. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I just were walking it this weekend, and it was just such a joy. It is. To see dozens of people of all ages walking, riding. So that marathon loop and gaining access to these greatest assets, we have the Yellowstone River mm -hmm. in the rims or something no other city has. So in, in my opinion, it really is a very important balance that we retain and improve the quality of life that we have, that we enjoy the beautiful natural place in which we live. And it's free. F I mean, yep. kind of. Yeah, while 
growing our economy in a way. So I think land planning for the future is certainly a significant area. I, I work a lot with Dr. Garcia and did with uh, Mr. Upham before that, our mm -hmm. public school system and all of our schools. We have some great private schools and public schools are critical to a, few, a thriving future. Oh, yeah. Everybody wants to know their children or their grandchildren mm -hmm. are in a safe quality, getting a safe quality education. Right. So those are some investments I know we're going to need to continue uh, to make um, and, uh, and, and really working in collaboration. I feel very fortunate, the work we do between the city, the county, um, Big Sky Economic Development, um, uh, MSUB, Rocky, the hospitals, partnerships, collaboration is one of our core values yeah. as, a, as an organization. And we, I really believe that you need to collaborate in order to, 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 to make the most and be the most efficient with what you have, right. as well as just bring in better ideas from those other partners. So, right. Well, the future looks bright. I think, it, I think it is for Billings. I think for Montana, we have a very bright future. Good. Um, All right. so. Well, thank you. We'll have to do this again because yes. we didn't get enough done here today. All right. Well, All I right. would love to do that a lot sooner than five years. Okay, Chris. All right. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on Your City. We'll see you again next time.